we tend to think of the divide between Tory and Labour as one of left and right. The problem is that this tends to confuse two important aspects. The economic divide between left and right has been one of high taxation and high benefits being advocated by the left, and low taxation and low benefits being advocated by the right. However, the left and right also tend to divide along lines of progressive and traditional social values. The fact that the Conservative Party in the UK has pretty much embraced all aspects of progressivism leads many to conclude that the Tories nowadays essentially are a left-wing party. This is only truly the case where the division on social values is concerned. On matters of taxation and so on, the divide really still remains. However, progressivism is clearly one of the most substantial issues in the politics of recent years. So how did the present position come about? How is it possible that the Conservatives, who as a right-wing party would be expected to defend traditional values, have in fact become champions of progressivism? Just what happened? The way I see it, the eventual surrender of the Conservative Party to progressive values began with a series of mistakes by the Conservative Party beginning in the 1980s. Throughout the 20th century, progressivism had proved victorious. Women's rights and civil rights had been seen through, and the Conservative Party had always been on the opposing, losing side. But that said, it had fulfilled its function. It had represented more traditional values, and as those had waned, it had had to concede. What however happened in the 80s, most likely as a result of the malign influence of Mary Whitehouse and her powerful lobby group, the Viewers and Listeners Association, was that the Conservatives ossified in their position on social values. The most notable of those stances was that on homosexuality. One of the key measures reflecting this position was Section 28. Section 28 of the Local Government Act 1988 prohibited local authorities from promoting homosexuality or gay pretended family relationships, and prevented councils spending money on educational materials and projects perceived to promote a gay lifestyle. This flew in the face of public attitude of the time. It was 1988. Boy George was in the charts, so too Depeche Mode, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Erasure and the Communards. The 1980s was possibly the gayest decade of the century, and here were the Tories retrenching on laws targeting homosexuality. It was a massive own goal. Moreover, the Tory party refused to recognise this, and made their hard line on homosexuality an article of faith. Public opinion be damned, they would dig in. By 1997, when Tony Blair swept to power on the back of a landslide Labour victory, the laws discriminating against homosexuality were still in place. These were easy, popular victories for Tony Blair. He abolished Section 28 to much public cheer. He got rid of the higher age of consent for gays, again with widespread public support. The UK is a very liberal-minded nation, and attitudes towards homosexuality had long since shifted. These laws were simply seen as unjust. And yet as Tony Blair set about changing them in Parliament, the Conservative Party still opposed change. It was a nigh-on suicidal approach with the public. One avidly clung to what was regarded as blatantly discriminatory and unjust law. One still hung on to the delusion that there was a widespread support from a moral majority surrounding figures like Mary Whitehouse. It was disastrous. By 2002, Ian Duncan Smith was leader of the Conservative Party one had already suffered a second heavy defeat at the hands of Tony Blair. The realisation had set in that something needed to change. And so at the Tory party conference in October 2002, Theresa May held a keynote speech. It became known as the Nasty Party Speech. There's a lot we need to do in this party of ours. Our party is too narrow, and so, occasionally, are our sympathies. You know what some people call us. The Nasty Party. I know that's unfair. You know that's unfair, but it's the people out there we need to convince, and we can only do that by avoiding behaviour and attitudes that play into the hands of our opponents. No more glib moralising, no more hypocritical finger-wagging. We need to reach out to all areas of our society. One might just as well have called it the diversity speech. Ian Duncan Smith's term as leader was a short one. He was followed by another short-term leader, the calamitous Michael Howard, who went on to suffer yet another defeat by Tony Blair's labour. Then came David Cameron. He at once seized upon such views as those championed by Theresa May. One needed to shed the nasty party image. No more small-mindedness. No more denial of sympathies towards any minorities. What happened in this move was the critical mistake. 
The lesson should have been never again to allow yourself to ossify in outdated positions, refusing again and again to acknowledge that you are out of step with public opinion. Instead, the Conservative Party now simply decided that seeking to take up an individual position on traditional values was simply too risky. One was therefore just going to abandon the field altogether and adopt the Labour Party position on progressive values. In a way, it mirrored what Labour had done regarding the budget in the run-up to the 1997 election. With Labour's economic credentials still somewhat in doubt, Tony Blair promised simply to adopt the Tory budget for the coming parliamentary term and stick by it. It proved a winning formula. David Cameron and Theresa May no doubt hoped that the adoption of a similar strategy on social values would pay equal dividend. In electoral terms, it did. But when it comes to the contest of values, progressive versus traditional, something happened which nobody had really considered in advance. These two forces hold each other in a balance. If you remove one, the scales clatter down to the other side. Rather than reflect the centre of mainstream opinion, politics on both wings now began to reflect unopposed any progressive idea being proposed by the left. It was the moment when both Labour and the Conservatives unwittingly turned to radical progressive politics. It no doubt had never been meant to happen this way, but it was the inevitable result. David Cameron had ascended to the leadership in 2005, two and a half years after Theresa May's nasty party speech. By 2010, David Cameron was Prime Minister. To succeed David Cameron, the Conservative Party chose the very woman who had held that fateful speech. In 2016, Theresa May, a self-proclaimed feminist, became Prime Minister. With progressivism being unopposed since 2005, and any radical ideas in this sphere meeting with no resistance, neither from a more moderate wing in Labour nor by the Conservatives, radical progressives have had the run of Parliament for a considerable number of years. The Conservatives still appear to regard it as a key strategic decision not to oppose on progressive politics in order to avoid another disaster like that which befell them over gay rights. This is hardly surprising, with the very person who had held the nasty party speech now being at the helm. But what must also be considered is the sheer power and influence which the United Kingdom commands in the world. In cultural soft power, the UK represents one of the greatest forces on the planet. Our media, music and film industry, as well as our academia, competes with that of the United States. In the Anglosphere in particular, the United Kingdom carries incredible clout. But also beyond that, the UK is a vastly influential nation. So when Britain was the first major country to fall to a radical progressive government, this had a serious impact on the rest of the world. Most of all, the narrative of this being the inevitable face of things to come proved irresistible. Progressive politics had after all won on all fronts against traditional values throughout the course of the 20th century. Why further resist? Progressivism was named after progress, after all. And now a major government, in fact the entire political establishment of a major nation, consisting of both government and opposition, had dedicated itself to this undertaking. I believe this played a major role in the proliferation of progressivism around the Western world. All British media output was now beaming progressive values around the world 24 hours a day. If other countries already had an internal challenge by their own left and its own progressive agenda, this international influence by a culturally significant nation cannot have helped in trying to resist. In summary, I would say that I am firmly convinced that Britain's surrender to progressive politics, the abandonment of an entire state to this political agenda, played a major part in spreading it around the world. This all happened simply because the mainstream party of the political right decided, for strategic purposes, to abandon its support for traditional values. With nothing to oppose progressivism, and with nothing to prevent its most radical element coming to the fore, there could only be one outcome, the one we observe now. It would seem that the architects of this calamity are the two leading conservative figures of David Cameron and Theresa May. They are the very figures who seem to have overseen the wholesale abandonment of the traditional conservative approach, rather than the correct stance of never again allowing their party to grow out of touch as much as it had done on social values during the 1980s and 90s. What will be necessary for this madness to end will be for the conservatives to re-establish their traditional opposition to progressive thinking. Not out of bigotry or hatred of minorities, but to see their supporters represented and to recreate a political balance whereby progressivism cannot run rampant. This is not an advocacy of mine of the Tories adhering to old bigotries of the past. Precisely the opposite. 
the Conservatives, both in this country and in others, must find new ways to argue for a more traditional social vision. But advocacy for such a more traditional perspective need not mean falling back on outdated, punitive approaches for transgression against moral codes. It can just as well be a defence of reality against the everlasting claim that everything is a social construct, that there are no differences between the sexes, that there are in fact an infinite number of sexes, and so on. The Conservative government doesn't need to be a government which changes the rules to allow people to have their birth certificate reissued with the sex of their choice, one of the choices being X for neither. A Conservative government can take a traditional stance without locking up people for being different. The choice is not one between their bigoted adherence to the ideals of Mary Whitehouse in the 80s and the progressive insanity which has in recent years been pouring forth from the universities. It is not an either-or. I fully understand what led the Conservatives to commit this fateful error, but so far-reaching have the effects been, it is high time the party rediscovered the moral courage to actually seek to reassert itself against progressivism. A balance of sorts must be re-established, and the controls must be wrested from the hands of radical progressives. For if the Conservatives abrogate this side of politics forevermore and leave it in the hands of radical progressives, then they are abandoning their country to an Orwellian future. That is all from the Sabbath Pass for now. Thank you very much, and goodbye.